question is, what would the state of soccer be, especially youth soccer in St. Louis, without Danny Long? The answer, of course, is not even close to where it is, would be without his leadership, his dedication. Danny was a good player in his own right. He rose, of course, I'm sure you know, from office boy to president of the world's largest brewery. He saw the value of AB's association with sports. Under his leadership, the brewery marketed Budweiser to virtually every adult sport. But soccer was his passion. He initiated AB sponsorship of the World Cup. Locally, he spearheaded the construction of the St. Louis Soccer Park, the first soccer specific facility in the United States. Unfortunately, it's underwater right now, but they will recover. It's happened before. Just think how many youth teams and players have had the pleasure and honor of playing at the soccer park. In addition to his international and professional games, oh, by the way, Denny was one hell of a youth coach. His teams won almost 600 games. He was inducted to the U.S. Soccer Hall of Fame in 1993. Please welcome our friend Denny Long. Dave Lang will help with these interviews. Danny, good to see you. Jack McKinsey is one of the winningest coaches in college soccer history. He was the leader of Quincy College program for four decades, one of the most celebrated programs in the country. He coached there for 43 years. He had 37 winning seasons. The Hawks won NAI championships three consecutive seasons. After a couple of years off, they won five more consecutive national championships. In all, he coached 31 All-Americans. He was a four-time National Coach of the Year. Jack was inducted in the St. Louis Soccer Hall of Fame in 1997. Please welcome Jack McKenzie. category for one tough son of a gun, you probably would find Steve Petcher's picture there. In one year, Petch went from playing his last season at Florida Valley Community College to a starting defender with the Dallas Tornadoes of the North American Soccer League. Oh, by the way, he was also named the NHL Rookie of the Year. Steve made 17 appearances with the U.S. national team, eventually became captain of the national team. But I think where he really excelled was the indoor game. He played with the St. Louis Steamers, Kansas City Comets, and the Los Angeles Lasers. Loved watching him play indoors. Oh, for 20 years, he coached young players in the Bush Soccer Club. Welcome to one of the real tough stuff I got in the Steve Petcher. <laughs> Dave Lang, by the way, who wrote the book, Soccer made in, in St. Louis will conduct these interviews. Dave tells me that the book is out of print, but he's hoping they reprint it, right? Very good. Okay, um, the first couple groups we've had here, you talked, uh, heard from some great players. Uh, the third group here, we have another great player, Steve Fetcher. Denny and Jack also played, but they made their mark on the sport after their playing days. So uh, let's talk first about Jack McKenzie. Um, we all know that St. Louis has produced countless numbers of great players, but sometimes you need to look up all the great, all the coaching records, the coaching leaders at every level of the sport in the United States. You would be astounded at the number of St. Louisans who are on those lists at every level. Uh, Terry Mickler at CBC, I probably shouldn't say CBC at St. Louis U High, but hey, it's, that's the fact. He's number one in the nation in boys coaching victories in high school. Vince Drake, who coached at Aquinas, is number one all time for all combined victories, boys and girls high school soccer. Tim Rooney at Lewis and Clark is number one all time in junior college women's coaching victories. When you look at the, uh, the men's coaching leaders, uh, uh, Tony Toko is number two at Rockhurst from St. Louis. The man immediately to my right is Jack McKenzie. He retired from Quincy in 2012, number 10 all time in men's coaching victories. He won an astounding nine national championships at Quincy. Uh, <laughs> a remarkable, remarkable one. He won three national championships in a row, and then they won five in a row. Unbelievable. So the obvious question, starting with Jack, is 
Your coaching had something to do with it, right? Uh, really, to be quite honest, uh, the Quincy program was built on St. Louis soccer players. If we didn't have those players, we wouldn't have won all those games and championships. And if we didn't have those players, I wouldn't be sitting up here tonight. Tell us about some of the great players you coached and they went on to, you, you coached guys who played for the national team, played in the North American Soccer League, played in the Major Indoor Soccer League. Some of the great players you coached. Well, I had the opportunity to coach a lot of great players and but really, rather than running off a, a list of names, I'd like to show you something. I want to show you who built the Quincy soccer program. Would all the Hawks please stand up? That, that's a tremendous group of guys that are here. St. The St. Louis made our program, and probably the one game that made the program was in 1966, before I even was at Quincy. 1966, St. Louis University, the defending NCAA national championship team, came to Quincy to play the Hawks that had only had a program for two years. And the Hawks won the game, two to one. Carl Swarzen got the first goal. Mike Villa got the second goal. That win stamped Quincy as a legitimate first-class soccer program. And everything that came after that stemmed from that game. And that's why all those players came to Quincy, because they knew it was a good place to come. And tell us about the schedule you guys played. You played a heck of a schedule every year. Right. I mean, we were in the NAIA, but we played a predominantly NCAA schedule. And out of an 18-game schedule, there was probably uh, anywhere from 10 to 14 teams on our schedule that would be in the top 20 in the nation. And it wouldn't be difficult... To, to say year after year, we might play three teams in the top ten in the nation on Saturday, Saturday, Saturday. Three consecutive Saturdays, we play teams that were in the top ten in the nation. And uh, it, was, it was just wonderful. Uh, you know, people in Quincy, Illinois, uh, in 1964 to 66, most people didn't know a soccer ball from a grapefruit. But when Quincy beat uh, St. Louis in 66, that got their attention. The next week they played the University of Illinois and beat them, and that got their attention. The next week after that they played Notre Dame and beat them, and that got their attention. And that, that enthusiasm just took over Quincy. I mean, Quincy really became a, a soccer town. But again, it all goes back to the St. Louis players, and it goes back to our competition with St. Louis University, with SIU, with UMSL. And you mentioned the enthusiasm at Quincy. Uh, the guys here who played at Quincy and people who had the privilege of going up to Quincy to watch a game, the atmosphere was incredible. Can you talk about that atmosphere, playing a game at Quincy? Yeah, um, we played in a, a stadium in the early days called Q Stadium. And if you came upon it, it would look like a prison complex. Big block walls around it, barbed wire on the top of the walls. Um, interesting place to play. Most teams did not like to come there. And um, it, the crowd, there's a, there was a certain period of section of bleachers, but the crowd stood around the field behind a rope and they were like within touching distance of the players and it was they were four and five deep when we played um, St. Louis in 1970 and they were one in the nation we were two in the nation with a zero zero tie after overtime the, the paper the next day said that there were 4,000 people at the game that's like one-tenth the size 
of Quincy itself, you know. So, I mean, uh, the people really came out. We had two local radio stations that covered all our games. One of them covered within a reasonable distance. One of them covered our games. If we played in Florida, they were there. If we played in California, they were there. If we played in New York, they were there. And we had about two or three TV specials uh, for the Quincy College Hawks. That's how the enthusiasm was for the team. And tell us how you got the job at Quincy, because you're a St. Louis guy. How did you wind up at Quincy? I got there because uh, Frank Longo, that's a name that's probably familiar with a lot of you, a uh, local St. Louis, and he grew up and went to McBride High School, like I went to McBride High School, like Billy McDermott went to McBride High School. Uh, but Frank started the soccer program up there in 1964, and he had a fellow with him, Roger Frankor. Those two guys coached the team. And then in 1969, they felt they needed a new coach. And so Frank invited me to come in because I had about three or four of my former high school players were on the 66 and 67 national championship teams. So that got the, the invite for me to come. And uh, that year, 1969, in the summer, was when Neil Armstrong stepped on the moon. And I, land, I lasted longer in Quincy than Neil Armstrong lasted on the moon. <laughs> <laughs> you mentioned 1969, five years later. Let's talk about 1974, of all the great years that Quincy had under your leadership. 1974, folks, this man was named the National Coach of the Year at a time when we had Harry Keough at St. Louis U, Bob Gelker at SIU, Don Dallas at UMSL, countless other great coaches around the country, and Jack was the National Coach of the Year. Tell us about that and what that felt like and how, what it meant to you. There's a bunch of guys sitting at those tables over there that were part of that team, and I wouldn't have gotten that if it weren't for the players that I had to work with. Yeah, I, I, I molded them, but they were the raw talent, and they were the ones that had to go out on the field and do it. And you talk about 74, besides winning the national championship and besides uh, being coach of the year, I had the opportunity to coach the West team in the East-West College All-Star Game in Winter Park, Florida. And we had about a dozen St. Louisans on that team. And again, I noticed three of them sitting right over there. I coached that team, and Frank was my assistant coach. And here's a story. But the night that the players were supposed to come in and report for practices for this game, Frank and I had driven, and we, just, we, were, we were really operating on the cheap. We drove from Quincy to Winter Park, Florida, <laughs> in my station wagon. So we're staying at a, at a motel down there, and it comes time for players to start coming in into the airport to be picked up. So Frank borrowed my station wagon. He went to the airport to pick the players up. This is in the day where you, you got off the plane on the tarmac. Well, it was at night, and people were standing around waiting to see who was going to get off the plane. And Frank was there with all the other leaders, primarily the, the executives from the East, and they were speculating who's going to get off the plane, which team's going to get off the plane. And when they got off the plane and they started walking towards the the building, somebody said, it's those bastards from St. Louis. <laughs> that, that's honest to God's truth. That's what the people from the East thought was coming. The game, we start the game, within three minutes we're losing two to nothing. We get a goal, Chris Carenza gets a goal. In the, in the, the end, by the end of the first half. The second half, Chris Carenza gets another goal. Billy Fan assisted on the goal. At the end of the game, Timmy Logish from St. Louis gets a goal. Matt Weiss, the goalkeeper, keeps the East at bay. We win the game 3-2. to two. 
The headline was e, uh, West Beats East 3 to 2. That's wrong. The headline should have been St. Louis Beats East 3 to 2. Through the ranks, there was a young executive at Anheuser Busch working his way up through the ranks, Denny Long. And um, Ron mentioned all the things that Denny did for soccer in St. Louis. But I don't think it's any exaggeration to say that the sport wouldn't be where it is today in the United States without what Denny Long did during his years in Anheuser Busch. Well, I think it's in my DNA, they mentioned DNA before, it reminded me of that. I really feel that it starts from the, your very basic foundations. My people were Irish, they came here in the 50s, 1850s, as did a million other Irish and a million other Germans. And they landed in, in various cities, one of which was St. Louis. Germans and the Irish particularly, and the Italians. Um, and it became a way of life to be involved in soccer. Um, my dad played, my uncle's in the St. Louis Hall of Fame. Uh, my son was a sensational soccer player. Um, it's just a perfect uh, star. The people here, when I come in, I feel good to be with soccer people. And I felt most comfortable when I was involved with something that had to do with soccer. And throughout my life, I have done that. Stayed involved in soccer and felt good all the time. One thing I'd like to say, uh, I was very close to Quincy and Jack and uh, Frank Longo. But my, my best friend is here, Bob Bernetti, who was also from Quincy and was a superstar at Quincy. Uh, so Quincy crossed through my life a lot of times when I was inducted into the United States Hall of Fame in Oneonta, New York. Frank Long was there, he came up to be there. He went to the top of the stands and fell off and broke his arm. <laughs> uh, there was something prophetic there because I got a scholarship to go to Quincy and didn't take it because we were a poor family and we didn't have the ability, financial ability, for me to leave and not pay rent. So I didn't go to Quincy, but I'll always have a very incredible affection for the for because of the people around it, that include you. Well, if you were in Bush was everywhere in the sport, and I think Steve, you could probably attest to that, playing during that era and seeing everything the brewery did for soccer. Oh, there's no doubt about it. Um, I think if you were watching TV, Budweiser was on the on the every commercial. Uh, for soccer at that time, and I think it put it on the map as far as the United States were concerned. <clears throat> Denny, being the driver to build the soccer park, you know, which is still standing and, and doing very well, um, is was is so instrumental in youth soccer and still is. Denny, how did you get the brewery to back soccer as they did during your time there as president? Well, the credit to August Bush the third. Uh, but the brewery was very good at doing those kinds of things that people didn't know about. But I had two people working for me at that time, and one of them was Danny Flynn working with me. And Danny Flynn and Bruce Hudson. Uh, we developed a new marketing program at Anheuser Bush, patterned after Arenas Mikkel's Total Soccer. And we called it Total Marketing. That meant that everybody was attacking the goal all the time. Um, and almost was impressed because every time he'd see somebody at the brewery, they'd be a former soccer player. Just by chance. Um, but that alone set the, the tone of what was going to happen at the, the brewery. And the people around us were just great. The key, though, was Danny Flynn. Um, I couldn't be at it all the time. Danny played for St. Louis University incredible marketing man and understood what I was talking about when I said total marketing, total soccer. And he and Bruce uh, created the programs that just made us different than anybody in the world. The signings that Pets was talking about 
is absolutely our standard. Uh, we started by mimicking the, every play in football to see where the television would center, and it would almost always center behind the goal on a car, or on a, car kick, on a, a kick. And uh, we put Budweiser behind it. Now you'll still see, particularly for the Redskins, you'll still see Budweiser. And we put them out every door, every door that you had to come and go. So it was trying to make soccer a part of your everyday life, as much as the great brands of Coca-Cola, Hershey, etc. And it worked. It worked in a number of ways. Um, in those days, you were starting what became Bush Soccer Club and is now St. Louis Scott Gallagher. At that time, Steve Petcher, you were starting to come up through the ranks uh, to become the player that you became. And uh, I've got to ask you something. When I wrote the book, I interviewed you, and I used a quote from you in the book where you said, I did whatever I could to win within the laws of the game. After the book came out, some people who know you quite well came up to me and said, did Petch actually say within the rules of the game? <laughs> so tell me about your style of play and how you stayed within the rules of the game. I mean, there's some guys sitting over there that played the same way I did. Um, and there's not a lot of referees here tonight either, by the way, because they don't talk to me anymore. But um, no, I mean, you know, the rules are there because they're rules, and I think you can push them as far as you can, and you just have to know how far you far you can push. Um, so I, I played the game hard. I played the game physical, um, and I just played the game the best way that I thought I could play, and um, it was successful for me. The year 1976 started, you were at Forest Valley. You'd been cut from the Olympic team. Nobody really wanted you, and Pete Sorber called Al Miller and said, I've got a guy you might be interested in. You went to Dallas, and tell us what happened that year. Yeah, I was very fortunate. I was 19 years old at the time. I actually went to, <clears throat> played for Pete, thank God. Uh, awesome person um, and coach. But uh, we won nationals in 75 around Thanksgiving weekend. And at that point, I wasn't the type of person that wanted to hang out in school. So I went to work for my dad's business right away. Pete calls me in late January and says, hey, you got the possibility of going to Dallas um, to go for a tryout. So I was basically a free agent. Um, I think Pete will tell the story that Al Miller, who was the coach there, called them and said, hey, do you know of anybody? And, he said, let me think about it. I called him back a couple days later and, and um, got me down there. Fortunately for me, I'm a believer in being in the right place at the right time. And fortunately for me, the, the English player that was coming over, that was going to be the center back for the team, the starting center back, uh, at the last minute decided he wasn't moving his family to the United States. So I got put in there and then took it from there. So you're not even 21 years old and your first game as professionals against? Pele. Yeah. Yeah. What an introduction to the game. Who to be honest with? I I knew who he was, but I, I'm I'm with Carl Gentile what he said earlier. I mean, we just we just played the game because we loved the game. You know, um, I didn't go to many stars games. Sorry guys, um, but because I just wanted to be out on the field all the time playing. And we got down to Dallas, and I made the team, and now I'm the starting center back. And who's the first team coming into town? New York Cosmos. And at age 22, you were captain of the national team. Yeah, um, I was fortunate that um, Al was there the first year. I showed up in 1976. I think we were in, at the Broadmoor in Colorado Springs training. And two days later, Al, being one of the senior guys on the team, um, proceeded to tell me that we were going on strike. So, because we were making $50 less per game than they had made the year before. So. So we went on strike at the Broadmoor Hotel outside Colorado Springs, which actually isn't a bad place to go on strike, to be honest with you. But, um, but yeah, no, I was fortunate. Uh, Walt Chiswitz brought me in. Um, he was the head coach, brought me in, liked how I played, um, stayed there for a number of years, and was fortunate to be captain. Um, I'd like to ask Denny, with your finger on the pulse of soccer during those years, you saw the explosion of indoor soccer here. What happened there, do you think? Some, for someone in your position and with your perspective, what do you think created that phenomenon? First thing that pops in my head is the Lywicki boys. They took a relatively 
low-key game and put chokers behind it. Music was added to sports, and then all the other sports of all kinds added. During the game, music was played, uh, and lights, and the end, and who will ever forget the, uh, the ending song? And now everybody uses it. But the Laiwiki boys didn't. And then they both went on to become managers of the NASL. So they made it something that was less than dollar. And I think everybody can take a lesson from that because everyone has the ability to sell something. And you're always selling yourself or your game or your whatever you think is good for the United States, or in this case, for St. Louis. Uh, no doubt about that. The Lyrican boys. And the last question of Steve to kind of wrap up on soccer today. Uh, you're very active coaching up and coming players. St. Louis continues to turn out great players. I mean, uh, for those of you who are familiar with the U17 national team right now, Josh Sargent from St. Louis is the captain of the team. He scored an unbelievable goal against Mexico. They're about to qualify for the U17 World Cup. Uh, so tell us about the state of the sport in St. Louis and the, and the people we have coming up. Yeah, and, and Josh actually just scored two goals. Help me out, Scotty, was it yesterday or yeah. the day before? Uh, scored two more goals. So it, every European team in the world, every, I mean, every team in the world is, is, is wants this kid at this point. Um, so he's going to open up a lot of doors for some more players coming in from behind. Um, but. The kids today have so much stuff available to them that I don't think any of us ever did. Um, and the skill level is so high. Um, and I think they're fortunate in that they're getting a lot of good coaching uh, these days as well. The facilities are better for everybody. I mean, Lou Hughes, who's sitting out here, has an awesome complex. You know, we have facilities around town. And it, it's raised everybody's bar across the country. And uh, I think it's the benefit of the players. And we're seeing now more players in the MLS than we ever have from St. Louis. Um, there's um, the female side is also playing in the women's professional league. And Josh Sargent is right now the poster child. I mean, it's, it, he's unbelievable. If you ever get a chance to go see this game, go see him. So folks, we know we've had great players in the past, but as Steve points out, we've got great players today currently playing at high levels and about to join national, international levels. So the sport is alive and well here, and it's due in major part to the contributions of people like Jack, Steve, and Denny. So I'd like to thank all of you guys for being here. Thank you.